Hello and welcome. You're watching Easynomics on Business Today Television. I'm Siddharth Zarabi and with me today, a very special guest, Professor K.V. Subramanian, former Chief Economic Advisor and the author of a new provocative book, at least provocative in terms of the ideas that it forwards, Money, a Zero-Sum Game. This is a book that's been co-authored by him with Professor K. Vedinathan. And before I get into the discussion, I just want to tell you viewers about uh, how uh, various people have described this book. Dr. Arvind Panagariya, former Vice Chairman of the Niti Aayog and uh, Professor of Economics at Columbia University says that this is a book by two of India's brilliant young economists who have produced this treatise challenging many macroeconomic theories and offering a new alternative way of looking at money. And Dr. Rajiv Kumar, the second Vice Chairman of the Niti Aayog says Money a zero-sum game pretty much stands extant monetary theory on its head. Uh, before on we discuss what this book contains, I want to ask you uh, why this book and why, it, why is this book coming out now? Uh, first of all, Siddharth, thank you very much for inviting me to share my thoughts on the book. Um, the origin of the, this book uh, dates back to the global financial crisis. Um, since then, um, we have been observing central banks um, pull out uh, what various people have called monetary bazookas, um, you know, uh, uh, conventional and unconventional monetary policies to try and stimulate the economy. Um, and yet, um, as clearly the uh, GDP growth, you know, uh, post global financial crisis in many of the advanced economies shows. And even during the COVID period, many of these monetary bazookas have actually turned out to be damp squibs. Uh, the question therefore that, uh, you know, arose in our minds is what is it that is actually, you know, leading to these, uh, you know, so-called bazookas becoming damp squibs. Um, and that's what made us reflect on <clears throat> the you know the the, the monetary economic monetary theory itself um, which is what you know sort of leads to monetary policy i'll give you an example just to uh, you know illustrate uh, let's say you know medical theory uh, comes up with the you know with with the, with the prediction that if you have viral fever you should be given antibiotic and yeah. uh, you know and and doctors then take that uh, prediction given by medical theory to prescribe uh, you know antibiotics to patients who have uh, who have viral infection uh, yeah. now uh, because that is the the, the incorrect prescription that is coming coming from incorrect theory the patient does not seem to improve but you know somewhere down the line i think the recognition that the patient has not improved does not happen and and possibly therefore the correction in the in the theory and thereby in the policy prescription does not happen and and what we basically did then is to first recognize that look the patient you know has not been improving so there must be something wrong about the prescription which possibly then could mean that there's something wrong about the theory itself that is leading to the prescription that was the basic idea that led to this book what is the central tenet of uh, this book and i've been trying to go through some of the explanatory uh, part of this, a preview really, uh, what is the new framework? So the key idea which uh, you know, current uh, monetary theory does not recognize is that banks are money creators. That is, you know, in one sentence, the central thesis of the book. There's obviously a lot of nuance to this, which I, which I will explain. If we look at the current uh, theory, monetary theory, which itself uh, draws from the you know, theory of financial intermediation, banks are taken to be you know, financial intermediaries. In other words, what they do is basically they take deposits from depositors and give loans to, you know, uh, to, to borrowers. And now theory does uh, take into account the fact that they do what is called liquidity transformation. In other words, they take liquid deposits and convert it into you know, illiquid loans. You know, you know, if you think about it as a as a, a, a parallel, it's like they're passing the parcel, but with a small transformation, it's as if they're taking parcel of milk and converting it into 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 ice cream, liquid milk converting into illiquid ice cream. Um, but but this notion, you know, treats banks as only financial intermediaries, which is that they are just passing the parcel. 
but in reality you know and and both of us having worked you know in a bank and thereby having seen the operations of a bank uh, what we've done is we've combined that with the uh, first principles thinking that our training as engineers provided us together with the economic rigor to show that actually banks are cre you know creators of money um, and and let me explain that if we take the broad money in the economy or the money supply in the economy that money supply is essentially a combination of you know the currency that we have in our pockets you know the 100 rupee note or the 500 rupee note that we have together with the deposits that we hold in our bank accounts that is what the money supply you know really is about now when you start reflecting on the magnitudes almost 90% of the money supply in the economy is comprised of deposits you know what we deposit in the banks and and one of the key things we show is that it is actually a loan that is given by a bank that leads to a creation of a deposit let me explain this because a very very important concept you know what happens in a bank suppose i go and approach you know icici bank for a lo loan of 1 lakh rupees what do they do they actually first assess whether i have the ability to repay you know and the willingness to repay and then they sanction the loan and uh, you know uh, the money gets credited to my bank account so what happens if you look at in the balance sheet of the bank you know the asset has increased by 1 lakh because there's a loan that has you know been given that's an asset for the bank but at the same time deposits have also increased which is a liability in other words it is the accounting entry of actually you know giving a loan and thereby crediting that amount you know as a deposit into my bank account that is what is going on so you know banks assess credit you know of the borrower give a loan which is what leads to deposits and so when you put these two ideas together and by the way we show evidence of this phenomenon the direction of causality you know um, it th that it is actually loans that create deposits and who create who gives loans it is the banks that gives the loans so almost 90% of the money in the economy is being created by the banking sector uh, by giving loans and thereby you know de deposits this is the key thesis if you even look at this year's nobel prize you know which was given for the theory of financial intermediation that treats these financial intermediaries basically as just passing the parcel which is what would happen if you and i let's say did borrowing and and lending if i asked you for a loan of 1 lakh you can give me that loan of 1 lakh only if you have 1 lakh with you you can't basically you know uh, do that otherwise but this is where banks are different banks actually have to keep only a fraction of their deposits you know as as reserves with the central bank and therefore they can actually lend much more and that is why they are money creators in the economy and that is one of the key thesis you know monetary theory ends up giving or not recognizing enough the power of overall banks and the banking sector and that is what we are pointing out banks are money creators if uh, if banks are money creators what Uh, what are the implications for an economy like india i want to come straight to that key point because if there's a new th theory it should have a uh, practical uh, sort of application in Absolutely. the context of india uh, how how is it relevant explain that to our viewers uh, no in, i think that's that's a, a very good question in fact the reason why we wrote this book is you know as practical bankers we basically understand the importance of bank lending and you know and and you know we did not want to be uh, you know the economists that are sitting in the ivory tower and actually pontificating pontificating theories that don't work in the real world in the real world banks actually give loans and you know that that's how that lo those loans lead to when the, when they're given to good borrowers that leads to increase in output in the economy and thereby actually increase in gdp now let's in order to understand the implication of this you know uh, we we provide evidence of this in in the book take two countries you know with two you know country india and south korea both of whom uh, you know got independence on the same date 15th august 1947 if you look at and you know we show this in the book you chart the you know the 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 private credit to gdp ratio which is basically private credit that is what is given and you know the loans are part of private credit if you chart that over a 60 year period six decades in 1960 south korea you know had a, a, a private credit to gdp ratio that was lower than india it was actually about 6% india was about 8% now fast forward 20 years later by 2020 south korea has 165% you know as a private credit you know to gdp ratio india is languishing at 555% you know one third of what it is 
and and this then tra has translated into you know credit for manufacturing credit for exports um and 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 in turn increase in gdp per capita and look at for instance if you take a very simple you know something that we see in our daily life whenever we think about buying an iphone we actually think about a samsung phone for instance which is manufactured you know in 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 south korea or if you're thinking about buying a car we think about a south korean com you know company so what we are actually pointing out is if it had been the reverse if india had that kind of credit growth money creation by good through good lending by banks possibly the story could have been reversed where you know south korean south koreans might have been buying you know if phones that are manufactured in india or cars that are manufactured in india that is indeed practi practically relevant because it affects the gdp per capita and thereby the economic well being of every citizen in this country would i be right in understanding that if we were to take this idea and sort of talk about practical application from a generalist point of view Uh, that this example that you cited tells me that india has lagged in creating that capital and that money and lending it at affordable rates for yeah. industry to grow instead we have perhaps still uh, and i don't know the latest numbers amongst the highest interest cost economies in the world correct yes uh, so it's th this is true both in terms of the quantity of credit also the price of credit um you know when when the price of credit which is what the interest rate is when that is high you know many borrowers uh, find it not very optimal to actually go and borrow but that is reflected in the quantity itself as i just told you we are at 55% you know private credit to gdp ratio and uh, you know south korea is at is at 165% and it is not just one country we're not doing a comparison just with one country i'll give you one more statistic that i think is you know it really drives home this point you know if you look at the average for the world or for the oecd economies in 1960 you know we are today at the same level that the oecd and the rest of the world was in 1960 in terms of the you know private credit to gdp ratio so i think we've not given enough loans uh, to deserving people if you look at even on the statistics over the last 30 years 1990 onwards the credit given to you know smes msme small firms proportion of that actually was declining only during the covid period because of the ecgls scheme has this actually increased and the emphasis on that you know and these are firms it's a small firms that actually are children that can grow to become you know giants and thereby create employment and you know uh, economic activity and that is one area where you know i mean if you think about it bank loans are like the life blood of the economy and you know that that you know blood has been pumped far far more in many of the other countries than in india and that is why we're actually writing this book in some sense i'm going to use another parallel you know viewers will will basically relate to this in the mahabharat um, you know jambava and the wise uh, uh, bear reminds hanuman of his powers in a similar way by writing this book we want to play the role of jambavan reminding our banks about the power they possess you know in being able to you know increase economic activity by giving credit to the right borrowers and also reducing inequality because if you one more statistics you know only one in seven uh, individuals in india actually has a bank loan um, if you look at rural credit versus urban credit over the th last 30 years rural credit is like you know flat while urban credit is growing at at a 45 degree line these are all aspects that the banking sector really needs to think about it has the power of hanuman and we are basically you know jambavan trying to remind them of that power if india's uh, ratio in the context of the south korean example that you gave were to reach 100% i'm not even saying match up to south korea mm -hmm. what would be the implications for the real economy what rates would we grow at what kind of capacity increases would we see so a typical you know thumb rule that is used is you know if suppose uh, the Uh, uh if if suppose the banking sector let's say bank credit grows at 15% then gdp growth can grow at about 10% in other words one and a half is typically the thumb rule that is used um so if we reach let's say 100% you know and and we grow bank credit let's say at at 15% then we can you know uh, um definitely target double digit growth uh, you know and thereby also uh, increase our gdp per capita and reduce inequity as well and I, this is important for me to emphasize that you know when banks give loans to those promoters who do not repay 
and that's the idea of the zero sum game that we're talking about you know you give to dubious promoters you know someone who's a deserving promoter who basically is, has a small firm who you know which he can grow to make it a giant actually does not get that credit and that potential then is lost and this is something which is very important so if we reach 100% and you know go beyond the effect on gdp per capita and also in reduction you know in some of the uh, inequity that will happen and employment opportunities will get created because you know manufacturing sector growth depends critically on credit that goes into the manufacturing sector exports depend critically on again credit given to the to the to the to the you know export sector all these are you know are, are employment intensive and they can actually also reflect in in significantly increased employment so uh, is therefore uh, this a point of comparison between mudra loans versus gigantic corporate loans for the creation of greenfield infrastructure for example is it either or kind of uh, situation so siddharth i must point out that you know the uh, book is making a fundamental point um, and you know i have always been a genuine believer that you cannot do you know policy that is relevant for the real world without understanding the basics very well i will emphasize you know uh, because you kept saying practical practical i think absolutely what we are saying is practical you know there is nothing more practical than employment there is nothing more practical than gdp per capita but we have to make the effort to understand the fundamental not just scratch the surface and i think it is very important therefore to understand that banks are money creators you know they have the potential when they have good lending technologies the ability to track the borrower you know and thereby willful default and default does not happen then they actually create money and output in the economy and i think this is very important that we understand the power of the banking sector in being able to you know sort of uh, increase economic growth and also reduce inequity in the economy so i think you know i would actually take uh, uh, or or i would correct the way you portrayed this it is not about you know a, a, a sort of a, a tussle between you know any of these two it is about recognizing the power of the banking sector and and also being very cognizant that in the last 60 years the indian banking sector has not delivered as well as many other countries have done and that at least going forward is something that can be corrected that's a very good point about the role of banking when it comes to economic growth sometimes it is not even discussed properly one of the other points that you make and i uh, before i get on to the next question you've also said crr doesn't work in the real world and evidence from india demystify that point for our viewers so uh, what we actually are saying is the money multiplier does not work in the real world and mm. this is important because you know current monetary theory um, you know uh, uh, talks about central banks having the power to actually control money supply in the economy through the money multiplier and i here you know i have to explain to the viewers because this is slightly technical when we think about money supply as i just mentioned that is comprised of the currency that we have in our pockets the currency notes and the bank deposits that basically we have deposits we have that's what the money supply overall is in the economy what the central bank controls is what is called the monetary base or you know essentially comprised of the uh, currency that they print that is an iou from the you know central bank it is signed by the governor uh, together with what is also called bank reserves these are nothing but deposits that bank banks themselves keep with the reserve bank now the way the monetary theory talks about money supply you know increasing or the central bank doing that is saying that the monetary base times the money multiplier multiplied by the money multiplier is money supply in the economy so the central bank can increase the money supply either by increasing the monetary base or by increasing the money multiplier and what we actually point out is that this money multiplier does not work it's as if you know act not as if actually you know the monetary base which is controlled by the central bank and the overall money supply in the economy which is by and large controlled by the central banks by, by the banking sector they are singing to two different tunes they are actually independent variables and we provide plethora of evidence to show that the money multiplier just does not work and let me point out a particular detail here what the monetary theory says is that money multiplier is the reciprocal of the reserve ratio so let's take some examples from the us and india to see why you know it has not worked in the real world so you know if it is just a reciprocal of the reserve ratio the before the global financial crisis the crr in india was 9% 
and you know during the global financial crisis rbi reduced it to 5% so what should have been the effect on the money multiplier it should have been about 11 reciprocal of 9% you know 11.1 and it should have increased to 20 when it was brought down to 5% what actually happened in the real world was a money multiplier hovered around you know between between 3 and 4 um, you know nowhere close to 11 not even close to 20 so you know the, that supposed increase in the money multiplier from a reduction of the crr never happened uh, and you know if you, you see similarly for the united states uh, you know even oecd economies you see this pattern over and over again that this concept of the money multiplier does not work at all and that is because the current monetary theory actually treats banks first just as financial intermediaries not as money creators in the economy who are contributing to you know maximum to the money supply i have another question uh, uh, and uh, leapfrogging a bit uh, from what you said uh, what are the implications for what you are saying as far as inflation is concerned and the context is what has been recently happening to inflation and how the cost of capital has been increased as a response to inflation which you yourself know uh, as someone who is also served in government that there are limitations to that and you have spoken about that aspect separately in the past so uh, i think you know uh, because you asked about inflation let me put it in context so that our viewers you know uh, appreciate um, so uh, see i i written an article in the times of india in early september where i had compared the three year gdp growth from 2019 to 2022 with inflation across the world you know top top 10 economies now the simple fact is that uh, if you look at every advanced economy you know it is facing inflation that is between you know two and a half to four times that of its historical inflation in india if you see the latest print came at 5.8% our historical average has been 7% so we are actually you know up there about about the same in terms of the his, historical average so this shock that has come from the you know from the from from the combination of covid and the ukraine war in india has handled it much better by actually implementing supply side measures as well so that is something which is very important for our viewers to to recognize that said let me actually talk about i think you know when we talk about inflation you know in inflation finally is when you have too much money chasing you know too few uh, uh, um, goods the prices basically go up and as i've just mentioned you know 90% of the money supply in the economy is created by banks and that is something which you know the reserve bank or the or the central bank across the world none of them have much of a control on as i said because the money multiplier does not work what can work and this is something which has to be focused on is essentially you know creating the right incentives for you know for 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 lending by banks which leads to deposit creation so you know focusing on the fact that it is banks that are creating the maximum amount of money and that is the most important lever to push so central banks as banking sector regulators and as supervisors of banks they need to actually focus far more on that particular role than actually you know the current focus on 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 the money multiplier and and thinking that they actually can control the money supply in the economy or or focusing on the money, money monetary policy function as it turns out i think the 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 function as banking sector regulators and banking sector supervisors is far more important to central banks than you know what has been talked about or what has been pursued so far in reality uh mr subramanian as we wind down this conversation i also want you to explain to our viewers something that i am seeing here which is the vaidya subbu equation for money supply uh i know just one question and answer may not do justice to that but in the limited time that we have if you could just take us through it so uh, this is basically a, you know a novel contribution where we you know have uh, provided an equation for you know the money supply in the economy um, and i'm going to use two terms that you know i'm going to derive derive from our upanishads um, you know there is this uh, words of you know paripurna and parishuddha paripurna is basically it is complete parishuddha means it's completely pure um, so you know in a, and and this equation is basically both paripurna and parishuddha in the way that everything that affects money supply in the economy is there in that equation 
Every, anything that does not affect the money supply and the economy is not there, and that is what that is the parishuddha part. That you know, if something is not there in that equation, that cannot be impacting money supply. But what is there, you know, anything that impacts money supply is 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 there in the equation. I'll just give you a a couple of important focus and couple of important you know variables. As I've just mentioned, it is actually loans that create deposits, and deposits. contribute about 90% of the money supply in the economy so it is actually bank you know deposits of bank lending that is one of the key variables that actually figures in the you know in the, in the money supply equation this is lending you know and therefore you know deposits that are held both by individuals and by corporates um, the second key part is government spending and government spending itself actually comes from government borrowing often apart from that you know the, the the tax revenue itself so that's the other key contributor to you know to 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 money supply in the economy so there are many other variables but these are two key variables that 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 really matter and i'll just you know end with this simple example if you think about taxes times when taxes are paid money supply in the economy goes down um and and that is basically something that is captured every time when actually you know at the end of 6 months or at the end of the full financial year when taxes are paid money supply goes down that is something that figures in the in 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 the equation in contrast if you take something like credit given let's say by nbfcs you know that is something that does not figure in the money supply equation because that is just passing the parcel is nbfcs that are taking credit from banks and passing it on to the you know to the borrowers and that is something that does not affect money supply because it's just a passing the parcel and 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 that tells you sort of in in some you know some some clarity hopefully that anything that affects money supply is there in the equation anything that does not affect is not there at all and that is why it's paripurd and parishud absolutely uh, i know this is a fascinating subject which will need many more discussions but i hope to uh, catch up with you again uh, around the budget and the economic uh, survey so we'll we'll try and pick up this debate once again mr subramaniam thank you very much for your time and all the best for uh, not just this uh, new book but for the theory that you have expounded and hopefully it's going to catch on uh, with that it's a wrap on this episode of easynomics if you've been thank you very much for watching time for a short break we'll be back with more stay with us Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella has hailed India's adoption of digital technologies and the social sector schemes in a conversation with Nandan Nilakani during the Bengaluru leg of the Microsoft Future Ready Summit the Indian origin CEO said that the adoption was the greatest contribution India could make to the world